technology is going to work a lot better than people think. But people grossly overstate how rapid a change might happen, but they, they understate how big the change would be. I think it, that's the case. We think the metaverse is going to be like augmented reality right in front of your face in two to three years, and that's stupid, and I don't want it. It's like, what if it's in 10 years, and you don't even know what it's going to be like, but it's just going to make your life so much better, you're going to use it because you would be at a disadvantage if you didn't. And then you have 100% adoption. 100 NFTs and all my crypto is green. I'm watching Gary V on TV. What do you mean? She wear Gucci and Louis, but her favorite Celine. My old school is old, but I keep that sh- Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Curated by Quantstamp. On this edition, we have AC as our guest, also known as AC the Collector, who is part of the 6529 Capital team. AC runs the 6529 NFT Fund, which is one of the most impressive NFT collections in the space that they are constantly adding to. In this episode, we discuss topics such as AC's background and how he found his way to the 6529 team, his unique approach to generative art, his thoughts and opinions on what the metaverse means and what it may look like in the future, and how his team evaluates collecting some of the most expensive NFTs in the space. We hope you all enjoy the show, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So I want to start with like you know your personal history. How did you get into the space, and what were you doing before that? I, I got into crypto itself through Dogecoin. Um, ironically, like or not ironically, but uh, in like 2013, it was a very good subreddit to just like have fun um on the internet with like strangers and it was just uh you know the like the doge meme with the broken english and it was cute and then you know somebody had the idea of uh of like hey we should use this 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 cryptocurrency to do fun stuff and so the idea came to like send the jamaican bobsled team uh to the olympics and i was like you know, just um, having fun, kind of like uh, raising money with that and getting some people's attention towards it, ended up raising 50,000. And like the context is that, you know, like in similar cool runnings, the Jamaican bobsled team qualified. And then the like Olympic committee in Jamaica just like wasn't going to fund the trip to Sochi in Russia. And so someone had the uh, the awareness of this and was like, hey, this is, we got to get our movie moment. The money was raised, that felt incredible, and nothing touched the bank until we had to pay for like the airlines and stuff for for these guys. Um, But in terms of the capital formation, it was all in this digital currency and it was fantastic. Um, And then, you know, we started saying, okay, what else can we do? You know, so the Dogecoin community in 2014 was like bustling with this great energy of doing well on the internet. And um, I loved being a part of it. So I got in through that. And then I was intimidated by the Mt. Gox thing. And like, am I just going to lose everything if I leave money on exchanges? Um, So it took me a little bit to get more comfortable with Bitcoin. Because Dogecoin, I didn't think of like as an investment. It was just messing around on the internet. Um, But Bitcoin itself, kind of like in 2015, I was like, well, if I mine it, then, you know, it could just be like running in my warehouse. Um, and at the, t- you know, at the time I, I was, uh, an airspace CEO, I founded a business, um, kind of arbitraging Boeing and Airbus, uh, inventory parts and, and figuring like the 747 is going out of style because of four engines, the triple seven has two engines and is taking the market share of that aircraft of the seven four. And so, uh, you know, there was more surplus parts in the seven four, and I would find ways of putting these parts into the triple seven through, um, you know, traceability was very important. Like where did each part come from? And I was kind of, so I had been doing this aviation thing and um, had a warehouse for it, had like engineers and things. And I was like, we could just set up these Bitcoin miners uh, with my engineers and they could kind of figure it out. And instead of going through the, you know, exchange of like a Mt. Gox, I would just be uh, producing new blocks so I kind of got into it 2015, 2016 as a miner, um, which made me a little puritanical. And so when 2017 came around, I was kind of like, ah, you know, Ethereum's a scam. And I, I kind of got caught away with, um, <clears throat> caught up in that kind of uh, propaganda, we'll call it, especially around like the SegWit and, you know, a miner had to signal which chain they were going to support. And so I kind of felt this, um, this like call of duty in, in the sense where, 
I was very antagonistically anti-Ethereum. And so I missed like early NFTs. Uh, and so to, to kind of, it wasn't until like 2019, I bought an Urbit star and I had to pay attention to how to use OpenSea. And, you know, anyhow, um, to fast forward to like more recently, um, I really got into NFTs through, you know, uh, a friend of mine who was a curator at the time, Sofia Garcia, got me in touch with Tyler Hobbs, uh, Dimitri Cherniak. These are generative artists that were even doing things pre-NFT. And um, yeah, so I kind of uh, realized through, um, through actually Dimitri's ringers that, you know, the code to, to, to render his artwork would now live on chain. And I was like, this is an incredible uh, this is kind of this like merging moment between blockchain and generative art, which I've always collected. And so, yeah, to fast forward through all my crypto uh, life into the NFT part. And I would say um, Ringers were one of the first projects that made me like, holy crap, what's going on here? And um, I think the fact that I didn't bet large in Bitcoin back then made me want to bet large on nfts because it felt the same kind of like i overlaid kind of the sentiment that i had and it felt kind of like 2013 2014 um bitcoin by just like looking at these jpegs we'll call them right so um that was kind of my path i think i collected pretty well in 20 and 21 and um yeah it led me into the 6 by 2 9 team uh because 6 by 2 9 actually had like 150 followers on twitter i'm dming with him like hey you made a really great buy. If I could help you at all, like, you know, I'm filled. I've like ran out of money and I'm happy to see how I could help you. Um, and sure enough, you know, he, he was like a super nice approachable person. And uh, yeah, we, we made quite the friendship um, back in like July of 21 uh, that led us to kind of like build this 6529 uh, collecting team where we all are today. That's amazing. Um, I quickly want to, Talk about the because I see ringers in your in your back uh, background as well. Um, how how would you say Art Blocks has evolved since then? Like you know when it was all starting out, right? And and how do you feel about its future? Starting out, and this is kind of what I use across all of crypto is um, nothing will be like Bitcoin. I mean, like no one was paying attention to blockchain in two thousand nine; it just didn't exist. And then if you were on like these. Uh, these like uh, cypherpunk mailing lists or in like 2009 or like in 2010, if you were on anarchist forums, right? Like the distribution of Bitcoin is unmatched. I mean, it was not like, I'm going to make money in this thing. Everyone was a full on believer of um, kind of like libertarian crypto values. And I use that as my barometer for new crypto technologies are, are, do they have like a fair enough early distribution system? And I think art blocks kind of hit me with that where it was like, um, I, again, I, I came in around February. I was like, damn it. I didn't get one of these ringers. And then April, I, I ended up like buying a few of these. And, um, and I think when I look back at what made me want to collect art blocks was like, you had to know about like, who, who figured out minting chromy squiggles for 50 bucks? And like, you got to be very, very early and passionate about stuff like this. And so I really, um, I realized like I was late in, in 21. I was like, I, you know, um, and everyone in front of me is like a really passionate believer in this discord, super nice. Um, and again, prices aren't where they are today. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't like guaranteed that these were going to be good investments. People just collected what they loved. And like Dimitri Cherniak to me was already a fantastic artist from when I knew him pre NFTs. And I was like, I cannot believe I missed ringers. Um, it really like, I had to um, sleep with like disappointment on, um, you know, feeling usually like I'm early on things and being like, I got to buy them in the secondary for like five, 10 ETH. Um, and so I realized like everyone in front of me is this total Chad who I would totally look up to in, in like Von Mises, JDH, Rudy Adler, um, you know, Snowfro himself, like all these earlier collectors than, than myself, the Flamingo guys, like 
I really had a ton of respect for them. And so it was like, wouldn't I want to be in that kind of, uh, in that, in a room with those people? It's, that's kind of how I figured our blocks was like, you know, these are kind of, um, crypto's best. And I was in a good club is, is really what made me kind of like, yes, uh, aha moment. How do you feel about the future? Like now, oh, the future. Based, based on where we're at, uh, the future, I think is going to be different because now you didn't have this, like. Uh, distribution into kind of just like passionate early believers. Distribution is now also going to people who are looking for a financial return. And that changes everything. Um, not necessarily makes everything worse. It just changes like game theories. And like it, it, it makes, um, it changes the game and the mechanics of things. So Dutch auction and these things were not around back then. And, you know, so you have, you have people now with an entry into a new art blocks collection at like 0.75 to one ETH. Whereas a year ago or two years ago, it was like two years ago, um, you, you minted a squiggle for 0.05, I believe, or something, right? So I want to say um, that I think art blocks will probably continue to have these like very successful curated sets or these curated projects come out because there's always going to be a good creative coder out there who wants to like experiment with this system. And then I think you'll see more like, um, you know, powered by art blocks, I think is going to happen. If you could get one of one out of N objects in a collection, you could build a network effect around, let's say a thousand or 10,000 collectors or less. Uh, and each person could feel unique or that they have a unique, that's a very powerful thing. So I have, um, I have a lot of like, uh, uh, confidence in this art blocks model as it scales into like, I think Disney, you know, for example, like not to be overly ambitious on something, but Bob Iger was in Venice beach minting a crypto Venetian. He's very familiar with mechanics of like, a uh, 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 a generative art drop and you know he's now the ceo of disney again and it just makes so much sense that i just went to disney this week if i'm leaving the gift store i could go and mint my little daughters one each of their own unique disney souvenir um that is digital and they could like you know I, so i could i could keep it for them until they're old enough to have their own phones and i i have the optionality of maybe printing it and i could frame it in the house and I'm like, I'm sitting here like our blocks could power Disney souvenirs and it could power Disney content. Um, and Disney is a content house. It's, it produces magic. It produces um, experiences and, and movies and theme parks and stuff. So it's like these, these things just feel, uh, not to speak with hubris, I just think these things feel inevitable versus status quo. If, if, if you know that this technology exists and could do that, it's really hard to think it won't make these kinds of impacts. Um, and so that's, I think the future of our blocks is just like helping other creative houses, fashion houses, uh, you know, Disney world, the Disney's of the world, the LVMHs of the world, um, you know, the like anyone that might want to have a unique one thing out of in scale for its customers uh, could look at an art blocks kind of model. So anyhow, that, that's kind of the future I envision. Who knows how long? I think people like me and others um, are often finding ourselves trying to accelerate into this future. And when we go and talk to people, it's like trying to wake people up to it, but it could take a little longer than we expect, but it doesn't mean it won't happen. So how do you do your research on generative art? It's interesting that you, you were into it before NFT. So maybe you have a different perspective than most. Yeah, that's a good question. Cause everyone, um, Every time a drop comes out, let's say an art blocks, you get all these different people's opinions uh, on style and stuff. I think I, I take more of an artist approach, artist first approach. Um, I respect, so you know, to be honest, I respect every single generative artist because they're doing things I don't know how to. And I have an appreciation for that skill. And like you, you give me, um, if, you, if you gave me a paintbrush and paint and a canvas, I could make something. Like I could draw a rainbow or, or like a stick figure. Like I could draw the most basic thing. Um, but if you gave me like a computer and you're like, try to even recreate the Fidenza algorithm, I could not give you, you will not even see something on the screen. I, I don't know how to. 
And so I have a tremendous respect for people who do, who could do that. And so I think um, if you have this like supply pool of artists that are already in the top echelon of like society's uh, best producers, let's call them. Developers are the highest paid class in companies and so, or, or like production within a company. And now they're being creative. They're, they're, they're like making it even harder to develop. Um, so I find it like, you know, you're looking at people who are trying to climb at Mount Everest. And so you want to make investments in the artists that like are, are higher up on this mountain climb. Um, and that's kind of how I see like the early generative artists, um, you know, like Tyler Hobbs, Demi like Casey Reyes, Dimitri, um, you know, uh, Ben Kovac, like they've been doing it for such a long time and I'm missing tons of names, like a lot. So, you know, please excuse me, not continuing. I could name so many good people who have been doing generative art for a very long time. My approach has been, let's, let's know who they are. Um, let, let's look at their ability pre like pre NFT world. And in a personal approach in 21, I did have a list of these artists. I was kind of aware of like Matt Delorier. I'm like, this guy is a huge stud. So subscapes came out and I was like, of course, um, because I, I, you know, so I had, I had that as a personal collector. I think that has kind of bled into how the fund looks at generative art as well, because it's just, it's having a system. There's plenty of different systems for collecting, but this is actually one that I've used and kind of has worked for me. And um, I, I think artists first, and then I like to see an artist maybe um, have like two successful, like those are, you know, uh, Tyler doing Fidenza and Incomplete Control. And I've known his algorithms before. I've seen his outputs before. Uh, Dimitri doing ringers and then pumps. Um, you know, so I uh, <clears throat> I could continue naming as well. They're like Matt Delorier with subscapes and then Meridians. Um, you know, when I see that, I'm very, I think these artists could persist in, in time as a, as like an investor in, 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 in their success. Um, also collect what you love. So it's not like this is just a financial thing. If it also looks beautiful um, on your wall, then go get it. So I have, I have a very artist first approach and then I pay attention to their collections and try to just like compare them against each other. Did the artist grow? Um, you know, and, and you know, maybe they kept wanting to tell a similar aesthetic story and, and it's even prettier the second time and um, thinking through examples in my head of these artists. But, you know, that's kind of my approach, artists first and then their projects. And, and where do we want to have kind of in the in the fund sense, where do we want to have kind of allocation for our investors um, in, in stuff that could like last in, in the cultural zeitgeist of this of this moment in time? One thing I really think about, you know, for somebody who is entering the ecosystem or somebody who wants to buy art, it is a very overwhelming process, right? Like trying to find and go through OpenSea. I even actually heard uh, 6529 say that for him, he finds uh, art through Twitter. I think that's what he said. That was his medium of like finding stuff, yeah. right? Um, so I just wonder like, you know, how does somebody go and try to figure out, you know, this pool of, let's say, generative artists and, and like make a decision that kind of speaks to them. But how do you find this entire pool, I guess, you know, without just going through rankings and open sea? Yeah, I would, I would, I would actually, um, it's a good, another good question. I, I, I would uh, strongly discourage any kind of ranking on rarities uh, because it, it, it puts more noise in your head. You want to be as basic as possible and being like, it's this algorithm, you know, as it speak, it's art. And so museums, like any, you know, I think as a baseline, um, I have a huge appreciation for like a computer making an, like a, an artist is someone who's building a program that then renders like beauty. And I, I, I want to have an even simpler approach to like, is a museum even going to give that much context on pieces that they have? They might in writing, but you still need something visually that could sit next to a Picasso or you, you, you know, or like 
that's kind of the standard I want to set. It needs to just visibly, like with zero context, is this a museum worthy piece? If you're new to the space, I think look for what speaks to you. And so use kind of um, tools that could help you. OpenSea and their thumbnails does not help you like visually appreciate something. And so start with a tool like a different website that could put these things in front of you. And you could ask, will this just sit in the museum with no context? Like, I mean, you know, um, which museum and what kind of genre does the museum, that's a different story. But you want to have that, like, start there and then, you know, to make this easier on people who are trying to get into the space, um, who do other artists kind of talk about and appreciate? And so I, in that regard, I think Twitter is helpful because, like, if Tyler Hobbs or Dimitri Cherniak are tweeting about, um, you know, like, Elida Sun's, you know, new project, it, who am I to, like, think that, that, that you know, this might it obviously might be something worthwhile to pay attention to. And so um, I think there's a lot of these examples in Twitter and the job is to filter signal and noise. Uh, even if you're new, you have to be okay, uh, good at doing that. And so, you know, who do you follow on Twitter? Um, that's kind of like, I, I do believe with 6529 is right when he says Twitter helps because it could be a feed that consolidates this information for you if you're good at kind of uh, that filtration. And I think he does it very well. He often is, um, is, is sharing with us stuff that is like, wow, I, I had not been able, this was not in my pipeline in my attention and I'm happy it now is. So it's a good tool. I, I would agree with that. And I think, so, you know, I'll find something that improves how you could visually look at something as well. Um, I, I would say as like maybe the second advice I would give. What are your thoughts on these kind of, these like big tier collections like squiggles fidenzas punks just kind of being you know considered above all else like do you kind of agree with that i i i've often taken roles at the fund now that have me traveling and talking to traditional collectors or like christies and, and gallerists and stuff and um they have we have questions for each other and uh i always i always like admire this this ability to talk to these people because they bring genuine questions. It's not like the traditional world as they look at what we're buying and collecting, for example, Fidenzas and Squiggles. Some of these people own, like I was with one of the largest, you know, one of the largest independent art dealers in the world and he owns 10 Squiggles. And he's like, should I get more? Um, so it's like, I, I want to paint this market. Crypto itself is going through a bear market and I'm like, sorry for all my friends. There's a lot of like just attrition right now. People are getting wrecked and, um, you know, SBF like is a um, mf -er. And there's like, you know, all these casualties. But in general, if you zoom out in crypto, every and two or three years, you add a zero to market cap of, you know, or to, or to, um, yeah, is market cap the word? I mean, what what is the uh, total crypto market cap like a trillion dollars? So let's let's think of a world where it's ten trillion, and you want it. So there's a market for what happens with the believers in crypto when they make more money. Of course, they're going to want. In my opinion, they will want a Fidenza or a Squiggle or a Punk, and those collections are just going to be this like Fabergé egg of the crypto market, and then, which is a real benefit I think to our market is that. It's all, we're also going to eat the traditional market. And it's just going to be a place where traditional art stores its provenance as a token. And the collector could like NFC the back of a painting and be like, look, here's my NFT. Here's what proves that I own it. That's my name. It's like, that's in my open sea wallet. And I own that token. It's just going to be how um, provenance is stored on a physical asset as well. And so like as crypto is just adding a zero to its market cap, it's also going to be um, continually to, continuing to eat the world in a positive way and traditional collectors are just going to get onboarded and I think they're open they're, they're not naive to things like they all are asking should I get a Fidenza or not all of them but the ones that are actually engaged and have kind of um, already some kind of knowledge or exposure to things know exactly what those projects are and I think those projects are going to do well so I, I have like I, we happen to own them, and and so it's like I'm talking my own bag with this, but it seems to me something that's going to be likely. Um, 
I think the bear case for this is like the government takes away our toys and, and you know, and, and let me be totally ignorant here, but let's say the government's like, I'm going to unplug the blockchain and you're going to lose all these fun things that you do and like the frictionless financial uh, and like consumer crypto that you're used to is going to go away. I would riot. I would be like, you're ruining my life. And so the bear case is like, I, I'm not just upset about losing my JPEGs. The bear case is like, I'm a very upset citizen. And I'm like, you just removed freedoms. And so that's kind of, it's a huge, I use this in the traditional meetings that I have. And it makes people be like, wow, this guy's a little too, um, he's going overboard. But I, like, that's my bear case. I don't think the, the bear case is like Facebook and Google own these things because I don't think they exist on you won't have a Fidenza on a Facebook or a Google server. It won't happen. Tyler would just not believe in it and to the point that he's like, how do I produce emergent beauty on these Facebook and Google servers? Um, and so, you know, it's like, I, I, I hate to say, let's go grab pitchforks and eye black because I don't think the bear case is going to happen. Um, but I, 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 I also get attacked by people who are like, you're too, you're too cocky about this happening. And it's like, okay, um, let me settle down in that capacity and say, it's not a hundred percent certainty. I cannot predict the future. I just, that's the future I think I would personally build for. And I think we're seeing other people doing the same. Moving on. How do you, how do you define the metaverse and what does the future look like in your thesis? So 6529 is like, he's a better thinker than I am, right? So I think he would describe it as, um, and he does describe it as a better visualization layer on top of the internet or for the internet of the internet and um, persistent digital objects. And so that is like a very short answer, but persistent digital objects, if you think about it for a long time, it is what an NFT is. It is what the ERC-721 and 1155 standards kind of like uh, 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 standardize. And it make, yeah, persistent. They follow me through everything I do on the internet and I could always just prove I own them. And they become part of my digital identity and therefore my identity in, 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 in my experience on earth. Um, and I think the metaverse in terms of what do I think it will be is that I, I don't want to answer that because I would make it boring. I want to I, like my take on the metaverse is invest in the people who could surprise us and build really good zero to one things that are actually going to have engagement and not like 38 daily active users on the sandbox, but stuff that's like, and look, um, I like real life too. So it's not like, let's just go supplant real experiences with like a screen. And I think that's what people who are not using the metaverse or people who don't, the doubters are like, I don't always want to be in front of, it's not inherently that it's going to happen like that in 10 years. Technology is going to work a lot better than people think in terms of, you know, um, in terms of like what kind of advancements we, uh, forget the quote, but people grossly um, like overstate the, the like, how rapid a change might happen, but they, they understate how big the change would be. I forget the quote, but I, I think it, that's the case. We think the metaverse is going to be like augmented reality right in front of your face in two to three years. And that's stupid. And I don't want it. And it's like, what if it's in 10 years and you don't even know what it's going to be like, but it's just going to make your life so much better. You're going to use it because you would be at a disadvantage if you didn't. And then you have a hundred percent adoption. Awesome. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it. I'm going to I'm going to read something that I read off the website and I thought it was pretty cool but um so basically what what it said on the website it says metaverse is not some silly 3D game it is the internet with better visualization and persistent digital objects like you said it will replace all current screen time it will be primarily augmented reality it will be your uh, ambient digital reality I'm I'm always thinking about this so kind of what that that says to me and correct me if I'm wrong it's kind of like you know you know we're not saying it's a it's a VR world. We're saying it's like an it's like an augmented world, which is probably some kind of variable, right? So you can kind of do everyday things, kind of merge between uh, in real life and 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 your digital life, right? My my question is, and I think about this quite a bit too, is 
what is an everyday person doing in the metaverse, right? Like, because, you know, I, I, and also like, how do you think an everyday person will be involved with NFTs? Because personally, I don't see that everyday person is buying a PFP collection or even art for that matter, personally. Like, you know, there'll be certain people who would, a small subsection of the audience that will love the art and buy the art and being a part of these PFP collections, which I think of as like, you know, basically startups, right? And you're part of that startup uh, by, you know, being a, one of the quote unquote marketers or users or whatever you want to call that. But what does an everyday person uh, do with the, with the NFTs in, in the future, I guess? Um, so, you know, I think NFTs will be everything. NFTs will be like a $50 trillion asset class. It'll represent all intangible value that has any value. Um, there's, there's obviously on the left tail, there's going to be like gas fees will influence what is worthwhile being an NFT, et cetera. I'm not going to like comment on that, but I just, let's start at the top. I worked in aviation and I happen to think all aircraft parts will go on chain. And I just like, I know this, I've spoken with Boeing and Airbus who are like, wait, in this world, I could also get royalties on secondary transactions that I'm currently not getting any royalty on, on my intellectual property, the landing years or, you know, so I think on the top end, everything will be an NFT. On the bottom end, we got to work on things. Um, and how you use them will be like, creator um specific and so i i I, 6529 is way more familiar with kind of like he has uh he 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 has more previous experience in front of what these technologies could be than i do so i'm going to speak i'll give a worse explanation than he could for that commentary you've read but um my crack at it is like I don't know what the bank of the future will look like. It might mm-hmm. just be Ave or Maker or something else or a new protocol. But I would love to meet with somebody on on an augmented screen or something else and kind of have similar in in uh you know this is an easier conversation between us than ten years ago. So you know I would love to continue that and I could probably get more out of vendors and customers and. And I could add more value in that capacity from where I am in my house. And I'm not going to fight that. Um, and then, I, yeah, and then I think it's going to be so. So then, so I'll have a bank NFT that allows me to walk into somewhere in the metaverse or something. And I'll have a community club one um, where, you know, like maybe it's a very elite members kind of club where I could have uh, meetings with founders and other people. And then, you know, I could maybe share my nft in in the lobby of that club today because it's my day you know like silly things is i'm improvising but i want to be brand new kind of experiences because what we know right now is that like you know a casino in the metaverse like i've used it on the central land and i love a casual game of blackjack nothing addicting and i don't go use it again i've done it it's novel that casino had ringers on its wall it was very cool and I still don't go back and like gamble. So we know that things like, you know, and there's like new real estate developers in the real world that are doing metaverse projects and like no one's going to those things or buying a condo in it or something, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm long winded and I would love to hear 6529 uh, in a new interview that he does in the future kind of touch more on that because he has a really good vision for it. Really good answer, by the way. This was a uh, makes a lot of sense the way you the way you were the way you were describing it. Uh, even the Boeing part, it makes like when I think about that, that's just like such a it's a no brainer, right? Because right now it gets sold on aftermarket, they don't get anything, and you know, yeah, they get nothing. And 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 what they do is like, I mean, to get too specific in my industry, but these are public companies, and yeah. you could check their books. And on the seven eight seven, they're amortizing six years in the future all the R and D costs, and that means that in year three and in year five and then six and in any year in those six years of amortization on that cost, their whole entire focus is recouping it and maintaining this monopoly on supply. And they like me as an aftermarket participant, if I was to go and try to take market share, they would blow me up. I would be dead. I would be in such legal issues. It, like you do not cross that monopoly line 
but the alternative to that is it, it's inevitable that like in year six, there's going to be competition and then they lose all market share for the most part. And it's strictly a secondary transaction now for the airline. They're only buying used parts. They don't want to go pay full price on new anymore. And so the OEMs always start losing the monopoly. It's a cliff. And if you tell them, hey, you could keep it, and it just like faces down with the royalty, but you get it on all volume. I mean, you get them like 20 years of recouping R&D costs, not six of a monopoly. You give them 20 years. And so I think there's a lot of inevitability there. Mm -hmm. And as I've thought about this, the airlines are not going to want to run on the Boeing systems and the management systems that do this. They would choose on chain. And so I think a founder is going to come up with this. I've thought about being that founder and like, I've obviously put a lot of thought into this. We have a bigger mission. And so, you know, I think aviation is one use case for this stuff. Honestly, it's um, every single thing will be on chain and a persistent digital object as 6529 says that you could use in the metaverse. The metaverse is not necessarily the aircraft, but as you're storing the record of it, yes, it is. And you're now you know, the assets now moved. And so this like, it's like, a, it's such a good ledger to follow you as a person or a business through life, documenting exchanges of value. Um, and if the visualizations improved, then I do think the metaverse is pretty inevitable. It just might not be what we think it looks like. And that's okay. Uh, that's that's kind of how I see it. Let's move to like one of the tweets you wrote. Um, and I really like this. I would love to get your take on this. And I think you said, cultural capital, Medici's were in the wealthiest Florentine bankers of the Renaissance era, but they are immoral because of where they put their wealth. What did you mean by this? I'll give credit to a very good guest on Bankless, actually, Josh Rosenthal, because he really woke me up to this idea. And um, he explains kind of how the old like the original Renaissance and the Reformation period before it was like technology inducing these human advancements in the, in the general population that brought about like the ability to create culture and things for enjoyment and, and like amusement of like, you weren't just like in, back then you weren't just like, no longer was it like, I need to work to survive, to get bread, to do what the feudal Lord, feudal <clears throat> Lord needs. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, um, you know, like, and then, you know, you had educated class leaving like monks and stuff, no longer just like cloistered and, and people who were uh, literate, able to like share things with the printing press. Like he kind of, uh, he kind of presents this like beautiful in the one hour, like articulate kind of backdrop to the original Renaissance. And Medici to me has always been like, you know, um, a name from that period because they seem to have sponsored so much of it. And I think, you know, I started reading about it and, and it happens to be exactly the case as like most of our intuition knowledge takes it. The Medici's were kind of um, second, like they were commissioning Michelangelo in a world where the Pope used to do everything. And and like very few non non uh, like, non-royals, we'll call it, like the bankers were doing this. Um, and they were like the top of, of, of the non-monarchy and like religious class. Um, but still, it was like there was, a new, there was a new subset of society that could commission culture and beauty. And I think the Medicis, um, they, they understood that early. And there's quotes of Cosimo Medici saying like, I will be gone. In 50 years, I would be like, <clears throat> um, you know, exiled from Florence, but my buildings will remain. And he like overshot. He was ex exiled in like 30 years or something like that, but his buildings are still there. Um, and I think that's kind of uh, an overlap. I think that's historically similar to what I see happening now, where like artists could just like these permissionless just go produce art. And it's not like go to the gallerists or go to the auction houses. It's like literally just someone could DM you on Twitter and ask you for a commission or you just want to share like Beeple does an artwork every single day and shares it every day. It's incredible. 
and everyone could see it. It has like way more reach than you know the Mona Lisa does in a in a in a, a beautiful room at the Louvre. And we know that the Mona Lisa is this like uber. I love this thought exercise. How much money is the Mona Lisa to the government of France? It's invaluable. It makes them so much money. I mean, it's like it's it's why like hotel rooms around the Louvre are like six hundred bucks a night, and for, for for the entire year. And then there's the hotel tax. There's the people traveling, and then cycling currency in their country. It is like, do not tell me that the Mona Lisa costs two or three billion dollars. It costs. It it makes France like it it's you know and I think six five two nine is very eloquent in saying this about like the Statue of Liberty and these cultural objects just like they're invaluable and don't tell me that uh, you could go buy the Taj Mahal if you could move it you could not and so um, I think like you know <laughs> I think the Medici's kind of uh, I, I love how our friend Cosimo. Medici of today, it's a good reference point. I think he is very uh, respected. You know, the, the original Medici from the Renaissance, he is credited with so much of the Renaissance because of being a patron. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a good model to learn from as we see it happening kind of in our digital way these days. That's a really good question. How many people go to France to, to see the Eiffel Tower versus how many people go to, let's say, Serbia? You know, uh, and both are in Europe, right? Both probably good countries, but it's just that that people just when they say I'm going to France, well, why are you going to France? Well, I want to see the Eiffel Tower. Nobody says I'm going to see go to France for the weather. You know what I mean? As a as, a, as somebody yeah. who hasn't traveled as much, uh, that's kind of their. So you're so right. Same thing with India with with the Taj Mahal. I completely agree with you. Uh, that's a very good point. These these cultural artifacts bring so much money to the country. And so wonder what's the equivalent of that in the digital world. Correct. I love, I love the example also of like, take Dubai and they built mm. the world's tallest building. They're trying mm. to meme a cultural object, right? They're like, they want, they're trying to build this assets value on their balance sheet into the invaluable territory so that they do get tourism. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, I've been in Dubai. I like it. I actually like it. I went with my brothers in 2010 and we naively were like, let's try to get the cultural part of Dubai. in." And it was like, it, it's not like this old, in, in my respects to any multi-generation, uh, like, you know, if you go back like 10 years in Dubai, I'm very sorry for this, but there was not like this cultural flourishing there. They're building it like Vegas where we're in the middle of the desert. And their meme is the Burj Khalifa. And you're seeing kind of how a, a nation state with a ton of oil would do it, building a cultural artifact that could attract kind of this like gravity and balance sheet appreciation. Nations are doing it. Why aren't participants on the internet going to do it? We have the internet and we have the distribution of the internet. And so I think that's going to absolutely happen. Um, there's going to be, we sell, we see memes sell for millions of dollars, memes from like the Reddit days being minted by the original creators and purchased. This was a 2021 thing, but they were bought up. Um, and you know, I, I, I think that continues. Yeah. A couple of other examples that I can think of, like, you know, um, from my own life, one is like when I wanted to do skydiving for some reason, I wanted to do it on top of Palm Islands because that that view was just so epic that you're like oh like I never thought I never said that I want to do it on top of Miami or somewhere else for that matter it's just that that was just something that was so like recognizable and you know that was just a meme in the sense right those man made islands of view you can just you it's know what it is right and then even like I mean the movie Hangover right the Vegas you you talk you mentioned Vegas right now I I, I wonder how much did Hangover brought to Vegas's economy. Like, yeah, definitely the Caesar's Palace where they stayed in that movie. Yeah. I remember going to the Caesar's Palace after and it was like you had to be the Caesar's Palace and you would walk up to the reception like did Caesar live here? Like you would do the same joke they did in the movie. Uh I was younger then in in Corne, but I did that. And yes, it like you know, if you look under the hood, um Disney like movie studios 
they do have these PR and like propaganda divisions to meme. Um, that's the job of these employees. They're paid to like persist in the public zeitgeist and at least enough to like sell box office seats in, in, in the, like what, what they budgeted for, you know, overshoot your, your expectation of course, and be proud of what you build. But it was, it's a, you know, the meme is a business in, in like Disney or, you know, Paramount, like NBC, the world cup. I mean, it's just like, these are products that you monetize and it's intellectual, it's intangible, like golly, aren't world cup stickers going to be very, very expensive when they're NFTs and not like necessarily on Algorand, but somewhere where there is a collecting culture like us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those memes are going to become digital. Interesting. Talking about world cup, we just saw us win their first game and, and like, oh, you we, know, sorry, we tied, we tied. We tied. tied. Sorry, right. Like, we we tied. 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 Um, how do you see NFTs having a role in sports like the World Cup in the next four years? I guess. I, you know, like there's the story of like what people are paying for the physical stickers and pin packs for this World Cup. Might be the last year that happens, and it's not being spent digitally, in my opinion, because it's just easier digitally, and you could flex it digitally and maybe you could get rights to physical stuff but um you know randomized like all these fantasy leagues where you're like um uh, uh in these like draft orders on players or picking teams in, in like calcutta's and stuff um i think all those could just be like nfts that i didn't have time in this last world cup to like build a fantasy team and stuff but i would love this skin in the game of like having a team on paper somewhere that I have to like cheer for when I wake up or, or, you know, something's happening. Um, like at a two o'clock game or, or a one o'clock, I forget when these other games start. So anyhow, I would love, like, I think NFTs will be kind of a distribution system for that kind of gaming, uh, or, or fantasy participation. And I, you know, interested to see like if there's the demand on the Binance CR seven NFTs, um, <clears throat> CR7 is a brand, but he's not like the best player in the world anymore. So, it's, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, not to hate on him. I love him. But, yeah, uh, I, I, I think NFTs will play more of a role. Can't tell you exactly. Pinpoint. Uh, hopefully, I'm surprised there, too. Awesome. Last question before rapid fire. I, you live in Miami and Art Basel is happening mm -hmm. pretty soon here. Um, excited about it? Are you going to be there? What are you thinking about it? Uh, what are your thoughts on Art Basel? Yeah, we'll be there. Um, I'll, you know, several partners and myself are in town for it. And I'm excited. I think there are some like good NFT things happening. Um, <clears throat> I think prepare to have the FTX conversation for everyone <laughs> that you meet that's not in crypto. Uh, but I'm prepared for it. I think we can make people optimistic on the space without getting into the negatives and the bad people. Like, I think there's a lot to talk about that's positive. People love the arts. They're here in Miami because of the arts. We are just a new medium for it. For the, and it's not even a new medium. Digital art has, you could not in the year 2022 tell me digital art is not real art. You know, even the haters who like don't like NFTs cannot take away. I, you know, Raul Marx is an artist who recently did the Alexander Calder Foundation project. And he's like the guy who did the Westworld intro. The guy is an artist. He's fantastic at visuals. And no traditional sane person will like, you know, I, they will not think that he, like they cannot take away his talent, you know, anyhow. Um, and I think, you know, uh, ultimately Art Basel will come around to like most of the assets there probably being represented by an NFT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm thinking time scale in my head before I answer it. It's probably not in the next two or three years we expect to be more vocal here in the future because we expect people to like, you know, I, I, I think like Rafik at the moment, just now, uh, it's, we're becoming part of the public art zeitgeist, I think. And uh, increasingly, there'll be more and more exciting things. This year, we'll have some great events. My friend Pablo has something at the Faena with Random International. <clears throat> um, NFT Now is having something. 
I did something last year, exhausted for this year and excited to see what everyone, uh, the, you know, the, like, uh, the Buffalo museum, it's like having, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I can't recall how many NFTs, but they're having like our friend Ixchels is doing a piece with them. I love it. And, uh, so I'm seeing more and more museums, traditional galleries like Venus over Manhattan and others. Um, pace, like they're slowly putting NFTs into their programming and we're taking over our Basel's like, you know, in that, in that kind of slowly, but surely that's what I'll say. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Actually. I was for the first time I was at, uh, Sotheby's yeah. Sotheby's in New York, um, last year or early this year. And I, I saw like, uh, the artist Krista Kim's, uh, uh, the, her, her, uh, piece on there on there. And I was like, so cool. It's only one piece of the, of the digital art. And then you see the entire five stories of like physical art, but it was kind of cool to see that, you know, and you can kind of, I was like, you can kind of imagine like as that grows and it hopefully becomes like half and half, right. It was kind of, it kind of grows and whatever, but, but that even, I would even say the, the screen as well, like has to be so high definition to be able to see that. Right. And that was beautiful. Uh, but I also kind of see that was, uh, it was really cool to see that one piece alone. So, uh, yeah. 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 And, and, and like, um, in terms of art, leaving you with a memory, like the Rafik Anadol pieces are so consuming that when you're in front of it at the moment now, uh, everyone should go see it if they're in New York. Um, his project unsupervised, which like was an AI that essentially, um, you know, read all the pieces, you know, like to quickly summarize, like it's an AI representation of, the, the pieces in the MoMA collection and this beautiful, I mean, man, it's, it's like so captivating. It's a dance and you're in it as you're watching it. Um, that's kind of how you feel when you're in front of this thing. And like the biggest physical canvas could be extremely impressive, but I think in time we will like digital art will um, win out as like, you know, it, it'll be the best experience maker you know to be like that's what makes me so excited um the screen is only going to get better it's going to become yeah. immersive you could touch it you could throw you know like imagine tap to activate like from NTs and stuff um yeah. you know like time is on our side yeah makes a lot of sense all right let's move into rapid fire so whatever the thought kind of comes into your head is is like what we're looking for okay okay so what is your favorite PFP collection? I think punks. Which upcoming artist would you like to spotlight? I guess I already did. Ixchels with the Buffalo Museum. Which projects are underrated? I think some Art Blocks Playground stuff. You cannot say 6529 for this, uh, but favorite Twitter accounts. Uh, I love Scott Lewis. I think I have a big Scott Lewis crush lately. Brand, individual, or team you would like to see in Web3? I've said the individual, I would love like a Wes Anderson in Web3 and um, a brand in Web3. I don't know. Um, most have already tried to jump in that like you think of with brands who hasn't jumped in yet. Maybe a sport. I don't know. NFL. Amazing. Okay. Uh, advice to new artists or, or builders or teams entering Web3. If you're new, you got to learn. And so filter the best, like filter the best Twitter feed. Amazing. Okay. And last one, one prediction for 2023. Hopefully less chaos. <laughs> Not a prediction. That's a hope. I think 2023, um, I think you'll have a lot better infrastructure with wallets. Like MetaMask ideally will improve or lose market share to somebody who improves your user experience in Web3. Amazing. AC, that was great. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Where can people find you? Uh, on Twitter, I think AC, the collector. Uh, and follow Punk6529, follow 6529 Capital, all of my partners, Batsu Barat, uh, you know, 6529 Guardian, uh, Bonafide Han, uh, No One OX, um, you know, all great. Like, I think, love my team, and uh, I think you can't go wrong. I, I vouch for everyone. This channel is intended purely for educational purposes and does not constitute financial or tax advice. NFTs and all my crypto is green. green. I'm watching Gary V on TV. What do you mean? Green. She wear Gucci and Louis, but her favorite Celine. Green. My old school is old, but I keep that shit.